Have you ever woken up from a dream so absurd, so buck wild, that you have no idea how you could ever believe that it was real? I have. But is it possible for us to let our sleeping selves know that we're asleep? And can we control what happens? Today's topic concerns controversial techniques to induce specific sleep states. Speak with your doctor before you attempt any of these sleep techniques. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Sigmund Freud, born 1856, is oft-referred father of psychoanalysis and equally oft-referred creator of the Oedipus Complex. Although he spent the majority of his life developing his theory of dreams, which informed much of what psychology has become today, he was wrong about most things. But what do you expect? He wrote a paper literally called On Coca, about how coca is a far more potent and far less harmful stimulant than alcohol, and its widespread utilization is hindered at present only by its cost. So, you know, the genius with a substance addiction was wrong about things. Surprise, surprise. Freud was not the first to do research into dreams, but his theories on how dreams are informed and can inform our conscious lives was groundbreaking. His theory argued that dreams may be interpreted, and every dream will show itself to be a sensible psychological structure which may be introduced into an assignable place in the psychic activity of the waking state. Essentially, he said that dreams have meanings that we can interpret, much like how we interpret books and movies to gain insight into our own lives. Like this recurring nightmare I have, where every cup of coffee I make is cold could be interpreted as my subconscious telling me I'm forgetting something time sensitive. These days we take most of Freud's theories with a grain of salt, but he did make dreams a faculty of science rather than religion, which has continued today. The burning question we've had since then is why? Why, why do we dream? Does it serve any purpose? Physiologically, it doesn't seem to matter if we dream or not. A study entitled The Possible Functions of REM Sleep and Dreaming found that deprivation of REM sleep in humans for as much as two weeks has little or no obvious effect on behavior. In fact, patients taking certain antidepressants, MAO inhibitors, have little or no REM sleep, yet show no obvious ill effects, even after months or years of treatment. REM, or rapid eye movement sleep, is one of the few sleep states, but it is important insofar as it is the sleep state in which humans dream. But according to this study, not dreaming doesn't hurt us in any way. The most popular reason as to why we dream is called activation synthesis theory. It was posited in a paper called REM Sleep and Dreaming Towards a Theory of Proto-Consciousness by John Allen Hobson, in which he argues that dreams are byproducts of our brain's lower functions translated into visual and auditory hallucinations while we sleep. He believes that dreams are as much a preparation for waking consciousness as a reaction to it. We are as much getting ready to behave as we are getting over the effects of our behavior. Dreams are essentially practice for our consciousness. If you're interested in learning more about REM sleep and activation synthesis theory, you can by clicking on our sleep paralysis video at the end of this one. But we're not talking about dreaming in general. We're talking about lucid dreaming. Psychiatrist Frederick von Eden, one of Freud's contemporaries, devised the term lucid dreaming to characterize one of what he believed to be nine different kinds of dreams. Now, I won't go into the other eight in depth, but if you're interested, you can find the source in the description. Eden identified a lucid dream as one in which reintegration of the psychic functions is so complete that the sleeper remembers day life and his own condition, reaches a state of perfect awareness, and is able to direct his attention and to attempt different acts of free volition. A lucid dream is a dream in which you realize that you're asleep and still have a handle on your higher brain functions. You are then able to construe and change whatever you like about the dream itself. It's the ultimate power fantasy. Up until the late 1970s, lucid dreaming was widely experienced, but there had been no objective evidence for the phenomena. That all changed when a technique, called LRLR signaling, was developed in order to provide a means of communication between a lucid dreamer and sleep researchers. REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep, is characterized by, you guessed it, rapid eye movement. The LRLR signaling methodology entails that, before the experiment, the researcher instructs a subject that, once they have entered a lucid dream, they must try to move their eyes from left to right twice, then rest looking straight forward, and repeat. Since rapid eye movement is random, when researchers looking at a subject's eyelids observe the very specific LRLR pattern, they know that the individual had entered a lucid space. 
The science behind lucid dreaming is all well and good, but I've always wondered what people actually got up to when they realized they can do anything at all. Hey Grill, it's that time again. Took you long enough. Reddit user underscore underscore Taligan says that in one of their lucid dreams, they spent the entire dream skating around their hometown. And the feeling in their stomach when they reached the vertex of their largest jump, that single instant of unbounded joy was as if they touched the face of God. Well, take that, atheists. A deleted user, coward, says, I was the ruler of Earth and I cured cancer. You're one in a million, pal. And lastly, Ian and Two says, I had a nightmare years ago where a bear was chasing me and I just stopped running and I became lucid and asked him why he was chasing me. He replied that he was going through a divorce and it's just really stressed out. You know, sometimes you just gotta talk it out. You never know what some people are dealing with until, well, you just ask. How are you? How you doing? Everybody says, hey, hi, hi, how are you? But no one really means it. Everyone's good, I'm good, I'm fine. If you're like me and never had a lucid dream before, but think it sounds groovy, is it possible for me to learn how to do it myself? Benjamin Baird of the University of Wisconsin has found that evidence suggests that lucid dreaming is a learnable skill that can be developed by training with various induction strategies, which include prospective memory techniques, external sensory cues, and interrupting sleep with short periods of wakefulness. The prospective memory technique is also known as the mild technique, which stands for Mnemonic Induced Lucid Dreaming. This technique asks the sleeper to recite a phrase like, I will have a lucid dream, over and over as they fall asleep. By repeating a sentence like this, you can ensure that lucidity is fresh on your mind when you enter a dream, therefore making it more likely for you to notice that you are in a dream state. External sensory cues include visual and auditory and or tactile stimuli as sensory cues. A study by Sergio Motorolim, MD, argued that these stimuli can become incubated into the dream content to alert dreamers that they are dreaming but without waking them up. An outside stimulus, like a light or a sound applied to the sleeper's body, would be translated into the dream dream space to be perceived by the dreamer and remind them that they are in a dream. Interrupting sleep with wakefulness is also known as wake back to bed or WBTB. A common technique requires you to wake up after about 5 hours of sleep and stay awake for around 30 minutes, then return to sleep. Stephen P. Laberge, PhD in psychophysiology at Stanford University, found that there aren't any specific activities that increase the chances of experiencing a lucid dream, just as long as the subject was awake for 15 to 60 minutes in between sleep periods. Multiple resources also recommend keeping a dream journal. This is a two-pronged technique as it simultaneously trains you to remember your dreams more vividly and helps you to keep track of recurring themes in order to make it easier to identify them while you're still sleeping. Lastly, if you remember the 2010 summer blockbuster Inception, you'll know the importance of a totem or a control variable that you can use to determine if you're awake or not. According to a Healthline article common, reality checks used by veteran lucid dreamers include looking at yourself in the mirror, pushing against solid objects, looking at your hands, looking at a clock, and checking if you can keep breathing if you plug your nose and cover your mouth. Since dreams don't necessarily need to obey the laws of physics or any laws at all, really, you can use these to fact check your perception and figure out if you're dreaming or not. The research done in the realm of sleep science is quite limited. A lot of the studies referenced in this video are among the only ones that exist. Lucid dreaming, so far, hasn't been correlated with any negative side effects, but it's important to mention that any technique that requires waking in the middle of the night or makes use of technology to feed external stimuli into a sleeping person can negatively influence one's overall sleep architecture. Raphael Vela, PhD, and Perrine Mary Ruby, PhD, note that considering the gigantic amount of scientific evidence linking poor quality or insufficient sleep to adverse health outcomes, including shorter life expectancy, one may seriously question the health consequences of regularly practicing LD induction methods. Don't fret if you're just practicing lucid dreaming here and there. The issue of fragmented sleep architecture will only really come up if you make a regular habit of waking up in the middle of the night. Just make sure you do it on a night you don't have to work or school the next morning. If all else fails, you can just sleep in and have a few more regular dreams instead.
Kane. You fell asleep. Happy birthday, little guy. Well, looks like you weren't the only one, Tuckered. I wonder what he's dreaming about. No foam grande triple caramel latte with cinnamon squirrel? Mm-mm, delicious. Thank you, Howie. Er, sorry, I mean Howard. Don't sweat it, meatbag. It is nice to be appreciated. You know, working here as a barista has done me a lot of good. I feel like I'm finally ready to move on from a past life. And speaking of past lives, do you know why Starbucks went from this to this? Well, our friends at Hook have made a fascinating video revealing the mysterious rebirth of Starbucks. Click here to learn all about it. It's coffee time. Son of a bitch.